أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد يقول الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون The verse in question inshallah brothers and sisters is a verse discussing the concept of fasting and how it's made obligatory on the person or on the people that believe now as it has been at the people before this time. And inshallah, we'd like to look at the concept of fasting in the light of Ramadan and in light of the verse in question, verse 183 of Surah Al-Baqarah, in which it states, in which it states that it is written for you to fast as it is prescribed on those before you. And inshallah, we'd like to look at the concept of fasting, especially in the month of Ramadan, in three particular stages. The first stage we'd like to look at, the concept of Ramadan, is to look at the definition of Ramadan. What does Ramadan mean? How has it been prescribed on the people before us? Has it, or do we have it in scriptures, where we can find that Ramadan is written? In Judaism, can we find that Ramadan is written in Christianity? And obviously we know for a fact that it's written in Islam. First and foremost, and secondly, we'd like to look at the different levels of the particular people that are fasting. Are there different levels? Are there different aspects, thought processes, spiritualities of people that are fasting? Are they categorized with the jurists, with the theologians? And at the conclusion, we'd like to look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tried to install the preparation process towards Ramadan, as in Rajab, we look at Shaban, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has installed that we prepare ourselves for this particular holy month. Inshallah, you can help me by starting with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The definition of Ramadan has many aspects in which we find one of the definitions of Ramadan is from the root word, which is Ramd, which we find to be defined as literally the staunching or the burning heat of the sun, and which is derived as saying what? That the month of Ramadan, it's where you quench your thirst, which is you are so thirsty because of the heat of the sun that you're in. So that's one particular definition. In another definition, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam states, he says, Ramadan in the same aspect of Ramd, in which it is burning your sins. And the idea that Ramadan is there, so Allah has given you the opportunity to wipe away your sins. And in the, fi- the, f- the third and final category where we find Ramadan in the traditions is actually attributed as a name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Therefore, it's recommended that we say the month of Ramadan to attribute it that it is a month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, we find that the root word, or we find that the main aspect of Ramadan is a name attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the idea of the definition of Ramadan. Now let's look at Ramadan, or let's look at the concept of fasting, before we look at it in Ramadan, that we had prescribed on those before us, as the the ayah suggests. Now we look at a particular article, by the name or particular name in which it's entitled Fasting and the Holy Month of Ramadan. Written by a scholar by the name of Sheikh Mansour al laqai he says in this particular article that in Judaism we find that in their books it is written that Musa when he's going to the mountain, he says then we went to the mountain to take the stone tablets or to receive the stone tablets the tablets that Allah or God, as they refer to him, has had a covenant for me or has made a covenant for me. Then he says what? This is the aspect of fasting. He says, and then I remained for 40 nights and 40 days without eating bread or drinking water. Remember this. He says, for 40 days and 40 nights without 
eating bread or drinking water. It says, after that, Allah, or God, as he refers to him, gave me the stone tablets. That's, what, that's Judaism. In Christianity, it's referred to Jesus as going with the Spirit, as they refer to him. Going with the Spirit towards the desert to be, or to be tested or tempted by the devil. Then Jesus says, after fasting 40 days, look at the recurring number. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he mentions it in his particular article. Therefore, we find even in their traditions, even in the Christianity, in the Judaism traditions, we find that their significant people, or which we refer to as the prophets of Islam, were fasting. Now, let's look at Ramadan. How do we find that it has such a significance with the religions before it? And this is a very interesting concept. The revelation of the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the month of Ramadan. What do we find? We find in our traditions that the book which is given to Musa, which is the Torah, what, what date was it given to Musa? In traditions, it was the 6th of Ramadan. The Injil was given to Isa when? On the 12th of what month? Of Ramadan. The book that was given to Dawood or David was given on the 18th of Ramadan. Doesn't it tell you something about this particular month? And in our traditions, it was said that on the 23rd of this holy month of Ramadan, the Quran was given to our holy prophet, Al Habib Al Mustafa Muhammad. So, taking into account the importance of this month, it wouldn't be taken into such significance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he had installed it so many times in his holy Quran that he says that this is the month of blessing. This is the, my month. This is the month in which you can repent. This is the month in which you can come closer towards me. Now let's look at the particular fasting aspect. What levels of people do we have fasting? Now the jurists, they categorize the people that fast in three different levels. He says the first level is the general level, in which we find from year to year it's a celebration for us. And this is the majority of the people, in which we find that Ramadan, when it comes around, it's a time where we get together with the family. It's a time where we can look up, watch shows, or what Musal Salat can be on TV, and we keep in contact. What shows are going to come on, what time they're going to come on. It's a gathering when we go towards gatherings outside, which may be or may not be in halal places. People look forward from time to time. It's a celebratory aspect. And that's the only level that they fast is they refrain from that which they eat and drink. And that's the general fast. And that occupies the majority of the population. Now the Jews go on to say there's a second type of fast or second type of people fasting. And that's to say Psalm al khusus That's what they refer to it as. Now when it says Psalm al khusus is the Psalm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Wants from me and you. What is this Psalm? When Allah tries to instill in us that this is a particular Psalm that He wants. However, the only the minority are fasting this particular way. We find that Allah tries to distinctly tell us that this is beyond. This needs preparation. This Psalm is not just refraining from that which is edible and that which is drinkable. This is, a ref this is refraining from that which is haram to utter, that which is haram to look at, that which is haram to walk to. When Allah tries to humble us in this particular aspect, He says, this is the siyam that I want from you. And this siyam is the most difficult. In the, in the narration from the Prophet wasallam, in which a woman comes to his house in the month of Ramadan, she comes, she asks the Prophet a particular question. After she finishes, she walks out. In the room, we find his two wives at the time, which was Aisha and Hafsa. Now look at the detail, and we need to take this ahadith and actually apply it to ourselves. And it's very important because it makes you think how much of us actually are fasting in its essence. How much of us will be categorized in the first category of the general fast, and how much of us will be categorized in the second category. The Prophet looks at Aisha, what does Aisha do? Aisha, as this lady leaves, she didn't utter anything. She doesn't say anything. What does she do? She looks at Hafsa and she 
shows to her that, you know what, this lady is of a short stature. She just says, you know, when we mock someone for being short, we have the whole sign of, you know, short in comparison to tall. That's the only thing Aisha did. Aisha looked at Hafsa and she noted to her that she's short. The Prophet, what does he do? He takes food and he places it in front of Aisha. She says, Prophet, I'm fasting. He says, you've broken your fast. What did she do? She just signaled to Hafsa that this lady had a short stature. This in our reference is Ghibe. You said something about someone behind their back. The Prophet gives it to her. He says, eat because you've broken your fast. And the Quran says, this is, do you want to eat the flesh or the meat of your brother while he's still alive? Then you would have hated it. And this is ghibah. You don't eat in a physical level, it's a metaphorical level that you eat from. The Quran narrates this. Now let's look at this aspect. This is the fast that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for from the fast in the month of Ramadan. And the third category that he says is Sawm Khusus al Khusus. And that's just for the infallibles. That's on a different level. That's not just to say to refrain from that which is haram. It's not even to think or ponder about that which may displease Allah. Ponder about that which is or may be haram or go towards those steps. That's only for the infallibles. And that's the top level that you can reach with fasting. Now taking these three into aspect, let's look at the concept of how to prepare for this month. How does Allah tell us to prepare for this month? And this is the final point that I want to look at. When Allah tells us to prepare for Ramadan, He shows us the months prior to it. Two months prior to Ramadan, He says, this is the month of istighfar. This is the month of istighfar. Then He goes, one month before, this is the month of sadaqah, which you have to give from that which Allah has given to you. Two months, we go back. Two months, the month of istighfar. When you say, Astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa atubu ilayk, when you come towards Allah, when you prepare yourself for the month of Ramadan, a person was in the presence of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he just said it. He said, Astaghfirullah. Ali ibn Abi Talib looks at him with anger, and he looks at the man, he says, thawakil. Ma huwa istighfar? This man is thinking to himself, I just said, Astaghfirullah, Ali ibn Abi Talib you know, is angered with me. Why? He says, Look, he says, Al-Istighfar is the word of people by the name of Al-Aliyeen. And it has sitat, or six main aspects. What are these six aspects of Istighfar? You can't just say Istighfar like that without having these aspects, or looking into these faculties as Ali ibn Abi Talib states. What are these six faculties that Istighfar instills? And that way we can look at how Ali ibn Abi Talib wants us to prepare with istighfar for Ramadan. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tried to instill the concept of istighfar two months prior when we prepare for Ramadan. He says the first aspect of istighfar out of the six is that you repent and you regret that which you did. Because nowadays when we sin, and this is why it's important that it's the first aspect, nowadays when we sin, we find the first time that we sin or first time that we Disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have this mountain of regret that we say to ourselves, you know what, we've just displeased Allah. How can we make it better? How can I repent towards Allah? It's massive. But as you see, we go on and every time we do it more, and we say Astaghfirullah, we do it again, we do Astaghfirullah. That mountain of regret begins to what? Begins to minimize and minimize and minimize. Until, what does the hadith say? It says, that sin that used to be a boulder of regret is like a fly that you, every now and then, you sin and you don't even think about it. And that's why, that's the first aspect, it's that you regret. That regret is good. And he follows it up with the second point. Do not repeat that which you did. When you say Astaghfirullah, you regret what you did. And secondly, you do not repeat it. How many times do we find ourselves, and I talk for myself, when we sin, when we do something that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the first aspect, yes, I say Astaghfirullah, I won't do it again. But how much do we go running back? When I lie about something and I come back and I do it again, I say Astaghfirullah and I do it again. I backbite. I look at something which is haram. I say Astaghfirullah. I go back and do it again. That's why the second point Ali ibn Abi Talib tries to raise is instilling that first and foremost, you, re, you are regretful. Secondly, you do not go back to doing that particular act that displeases Allah. 
Number two. Number three, and this is, this is where it begins to get interesting. Until the last point, we'll begin to analyze how hard istighfar actually is. The third point, he mentions Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says that everything that you owe between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look, he looks at the spiritual aspect first before he looks at how you install relations. He says anything that you owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be prayers, whether it be fasting, whether it be any of the worships between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be you making a nidr that you haven't done, whether you've been saying, I want to read this particular Quran, I want to pray this particular prayer, and you haven't. He says, make sure you are up to date. That's the third level. That's between you and Allah. The fourth level, he says, anything between you and the people, anything you owe someone, anything that you've said behind someone's back, make sure you go and you clear the waters. You know, when you go to Hajj, when Allah says you want to purify you, when you go to Hajj, it diminishes all your sins. One of the aspects is what? You have to go and take and make everything right between the people that you've hurt. Give the amana back to those who have given it to you. You make sure your slate is clean. So the fourth level, after he says on the third level that between you and Allah, make sure everything is clear between you and the people on the fourth occasion. Make sure everything is clear. On the fifth level, and this is where it begins to become beautiful. He says, Ali ibn Abi Talib, every meat and every fat in your body that has been built and supplemented from haram, whether it be haram in the aspect of food or haram in the aspect of wealth that gave that food, make sure you burn it off. Make sure you burn it off. Now that takes in a different level altogether. We're not going to into that at the moment, but I'll let you ponder over it. And on the sixth and final level, look at what Ali ibn Abi Talib says, as the final level of istighfar. He says the final level of istighfar is that in yourself, that pleasure that you felt when sinning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the pleasure that you felt, make sure you reciprocate that by humbling yourself with worship. When you stayed up the night in haram, make sure you stay up the night humbling yourself in prostration. When you look towards that which is haram, make sure you humble this eye with looking at that which is from Allah, which is the Quran, which is nature, and begin to say, Subhanallah, MashaAllah. That tongue which uttered the foul language and back bits, make sure that tongue utters the Holy Quran. Make sure that tongue utters that which is beautiful towards people. These legs that took you towards that which is haram, make sure they stand firm on the prayer mat so they may stand firm on the sirat. Everything, every sense that you have that went against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ali is trying to teach us that make sure you humble yourself. Every single time we are given this, when we look at the, the book of the ethics of prayers, it tells you from the instance, this is all preparation. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through his messengers, through his awsiya, prepare yourself for Ramadan. Let's take metaphors when we prepare for anything. Whether it be any ibadah, let's say, let's say hajj, we took the example of hajj. Let's look at the ibadah, which is salah. We pray five prayers a day, three times. Let's look at the preparation for salah. When we look at wudu, what do we think of wudu? Or do we just chuck some water on in a particular order and forget about it? Wudu is such an important aspect if we look at the metaphorical aspect of it. It says, look at water. The article says, look at water as a preparation progress. It says water is clear, it purifies those around it. Let's look at water and say to ourselves that like how water purifies those around it, let me be like water. I'm purifying myself. It says when I wipe that water on my face, it says make sure my thoughts, my eyes, my scent, or when I smell, when I taste, I make sure all that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, when I wipe my right hand, make sure this right hand is only in the obedience of Allah. And likewise, my left. When I wipe on my head, make sure my thought process is not that which is haram. 
is not that which is inclined towards haram. Make sure my thought process is inclined with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with me with. When I wipe my legs, I make sure that I will walk to the prayer mat and I will not walk to that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just water. If we think about the specific aspects, the underlying aspects that we do not even ponder about in usual facts, but if we look at the preparation progress that Allah tries to instill in us, we begin to analyze how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these jewels that we don't even comprehend, nor do we use. That's on the first instance. And the second instance, after we find the aspect of istighfar, take istighfar out. The second thing is tasadduq. When Allah says, give charity, when Allah says, give charity, it's for our own protection. Do you think it's just to allow the less fortunate or the less people that have less to take from this? Or it's a protection for ourselves? When the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, says to his companions, as a man passes him by, he says, this man will die from his journey. He, won't, he will not return. He's not going to return. So the companion says, okay, we're going to wait for his funeral. He goes back, he comes, and they go towards the Prophet. They say, oh, Prophet of Islam, you said this man was about to die. Why is it that he is still alive? It is not of your attributes that you've told us something that has not come true. So the Prophet says, come with me. Let's go to this man. Let's see what this man has done. So they go to him, and the Prophet asks him, he says, what have you done of good deeds in this journey of yours? He says, nothing. I went to the journey, I came back. He says, did you give anyone something? Did you help a stranger out? He says, I had two loaves of bread. He says, on the way, I ate one. I had one remaining. I saw a, a struggler. I gave him the other piece. The Prophet says, did you see? He says, bring down your backpack or the bag that he had. He took it down. He says, open the bag. He says, as soon as you open the bag, a thu'ban emerged from that bag. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote that this particular snake would be the cause of your death. However, that charity that you gave has saved you from this particular demise. In another narration from the Prophet Isa, alayhi afdala salatu wa salam, we find that Isa ibn Maryam tells his companions the same thing. As this woman comes past, he says, this woman, or this bride at the time, he says, tomorrow she will not wake up, but she will die in her sleep. The next day, she, they find her in the marketplace. They go towards Isa ibn Maryam. They say, Isa, he says, you said this woman would die. He says, come with me. He goes into the house. He knocks the door. He says, do you allow us to enter? So she goes. She asks. She comes back. She goes, of course, you may enter. He comes inside, and he says, what have you done? in these past nights, or this past day of charity? What have you given up? She says nothing. He says, think harder. What have you done that Allah may be pleased with you? He says, she says, honestly, the only thing that I can remember is because I was getting married. He says, we usually have a, a, a strangler coming towards our house, knocking the door every day, and we give the remains of our food to this particular stranger. And he says, that day everyone was occupied, so I thought to myself, while everyone is occupied with my wedding, I will not forget this particular person that knocks every day. So she gave this particular stranger of the nicest food that they prepared for the wedding. They gave it to her, and Isa ibn Maryam, what does he say? He says, go towards the bed, and we need to lift the mattress up. And as soon as he lifted the mattress, they found it, yes. There and then, you find the same aspect. There was a snake there waiting to devour her. And he says, because of the charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed the snake not to attack you, not to kill you. Now we find that sadaqah on the one aspect humbles us. On the other aspect, it saves us. On the other aspect, it's a protection for us. In the first two months before Ramadan, Allah tries to teach us the aspect of istighfar. We said the second month, he tries to give us the idea that we should give from that which Allah has granted us. And in the month of Ramadan, this is where it starts. The holy month of Ramadan is where you've prepared. Everything needs preparation. As we stated, Hajj needs preparation. We find Salah preparation. Not just in a physical level, but in a mental level as well. 
and likewise Siyam. Siyam occupies the most aspect of our ibadat. If we find Salat, Salat, let's say, if, let's say everyone prays like Ja'far al-Tayyar, let's say, for example, one hour of our day is spent praying. One hour. Times it by the whole year. One hour times, let's say, 365. How many? 365 hours we find. Let's, let's look at Siyam. On an average scale, let's say 12 hours we fast. Times that by 30 days. And then we see how much we're actually in ibadah in comparison to the other months. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even when you sleep in this holy month, even when you sleep, it's ibadah. When you breathe, it's tasbih. Look how much this month occupies for ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reference to hajj, which may take a couple of weeks. If you calculate it, it's roughly 400 hours that you spend just this month in ibadah. Do you not think that you need to prepare for these 400 hours? Do you not think you should prepare in gaining closeness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Should we not prepare when it has that much aspect on it, that much value in it? When Layal al-Qadr, we have a narration that says Laylatul Qadr, khayrun min alfi shahr, in the aspect that every deed and all our worship will be given and portrayed towards the Imam of our time in which he decides. Our whole next year will be governed by one night in this particular night, which is Laylatul Qadr. Should we not prepare for that? Should we not think to ourselves that we want to be the best that we want to be from this month? We want to achieve the best during this month. Let's think about this, brothers and sisters. And inshallah, we do emerge from this month the best of people and elevated in both spiritually, mentally, physically, in closeness towards Allah. We want to leave behind all the bad habits. Because remember, it's all about practice, practice. Bad practices have their attributes. Good practices also have their attributes. When we find an example of, let's say, smoking, and the example of bad attributes, because it diminishes the health of one's physical being. How did smoking start? If you ask a smoker, number one, he said, I was hanging out, let's say. It's all a step process. He says, number one, I was hanging out one day with one of my friends. I wasn't smoking, but I used to hang out with them. He says, on a second instance, one day came, weeks. They said, hold the cigarette. Don't smoke, just hold the cigarette. A couple of weeks passed, I need to gain respect with my friends. They said, just take a puff. You find it down the track, he's a chain smoker. Why? Because that one day he went into that aspect. Now that's just the bad aspect. Al-amthal, tudrab wala, tuqas. We're not saying in a, sin, in a sin aspect, but to give you an idea of how it may be affected. When the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, states the bad friends are like those that a person befriends a blacksmith. When you have a person that works in the metals, etc., when you go towards him, you don't do anything. You don't help him with his work. You just stay there. Nothing. It says, except you staying there, some of his work will rub off on you. That stain will rub off on your garments. You will see the effects. It says, likewise, a good friend is the example of a person that works with fragrances. As long as you have that good friend, let's say he works with fragrances. You're not doing anything, however you're around him. But some of that beautiful scent will be visible on you, will be smelt on you, because you're just next to that guy, next to that particular friend. Let's choose our friends in that particular perspective. Let's choose the people that will get us towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will instill us and make us firm in this path. These are the examples that we're given. Let's learn from them, inshallah, and say to ourselves, this Ramadan will be the best Ramadan we'll ever have. Let's say to ourselves, inshallah, that Allah blesses us with the foresight to see what we will become and what we can achieve at the end of this month. We pray to Allah, inshallah, on this ending, ending note, that Allah resurrects us with the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asr wa zaman He resurrects us on the Day of Judgment as one of the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he keeps us solid on the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.